of what's going on in the army or across the military in general is the problem in itself. And how do you solve a problem if you avoid a problem? You can't. A lot of people are avoiding the problem by saying, don't do it. And I'm looking at it going, well, maybe we might need to. Maybe we might need to step up and, 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 and understand that selfless service means we sacrifice a little bit for the sake of what we say we stand for. And I, so I'm, I'm, I'm already in that kind of thought process right now at, at my age going, you know what? Like who's going to, who's worth their salt going to step up and fix it? And we just going to bitch about it or are we going to do something? Where do we actually put ourselves in action to change that whole paradigm so we can actually still have a fighting force worth it that, that matters that it protects America? Welcome to the Firearms Nation podcast. And tonight I am, well, it could be today where you're at, but it's tonight here. I am very fortunate to have uh, someone who was not only a combat veteran, he did three tours in combat, which is exceptional. And we'll talk about that. But he is also uh, uh, has a baseball pitching background and believe it or not, uh, bull riding. I mean, I, I think he's going to be the full, first bull rider I, I've ever had on the show. Uh, he is a, a person who coaches people and he coaches top people uh, in business and in leadership. Uh, he's the founder of Radical Performance Acceleration, which is his program and high performance uh, mediation. And uh, I mean, that sounds like esoteric concepts, but we're going to break them down. And he's going to tell me more about it. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I am going to bring on the show uh, Wiley McGraw. Wiley, how are you doing? I'm doing well, brother. Thanks for having me. Oh, it, it's really a pleasure, you know, because uh, one of the benefits, and as, as you know, because you do have a podcast, and we'll talk about that in a second, but you, you get to interact and talk to people. Now, I know there's people in the world who don't like to talk to other people, but I'm, I'm a person who who likes to uh, break down and and hear different uh, experiences, and you know what? With yeah. talking to people, I learn from that. So, um, y- you do have a podcast, and it's called Wise Words and Whiskey. And in honor of that podcast, I I have a little pour here. Uh, for those of you that can't see, uh, it it is. Uh, I'll tell you, it's Buffalo Trace. It's it's probably like my okay. go to pour. Uh, what what's your pour? I'm a single malt Scotch. Uh, aficionado. So I, I typically go with the Balvini. If I, if I have to choose one, that's the one I, I usually drink the double wood 12, uh, Portwood 21, things like that. But again, I'm not a snoot when it comes to like the age, uh, you know, <laughs> characteristics. I like a good whiskey when it's time to sip a good whiskey. Yes. Uh, I, I just, uh, I went over overseas and, you know, part of the, uh, benefits of when I'm overseas is like, if I'm overseas and I'm working hard, I want to, party hard at the hotel afterwards and at the bar it was a very upscale hotel and they had a very nice bar yeah. and i did partake in the belvini um 21 and uh yeah. it's not cheap um but yeah, it oh it was so good uh it's going to be on my uh uh well when uh when i go to the single shot you could see the, the yeah. alcohol behind me but uh <laughs> yeah that i was surprised and then for those of you who are McAllen lovers, uh, McAllen overseas, they have a lot more selection than they do here. And they had this yeah, uh, hey. Elements series, which is so good. Um, so I don't know if you've tried that yet, but uh, it, is, it is something to look forward to. Yeah, I, you know, I grew up in a uh, half Scottish, half Irish family. So my dad's mother was from Scotland. So I grew up as or around whiskey connoisseurs. And in the Scottish region, the, the space side and Highlands region where you get your McAllen's, you get your Balvenies, your Aperfeldies. Those are the sweeter with like the spices and the more oaky honey notes uh, when it comes to your whiskeys. I prefer those, but I don't mind, you know, uh, you know, venturing out into the smokier areas and the more like robust, you know, uh, salty, more seawater type flavors. But that's, I, I know that line. I've never had it, but I've heard it's pretty good. Uh, so when you say the smoky, is that like the more, the, the more peaty stuff? Like, I, th- I think yeah, it's Highland the PD and the Islay, yeah, 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 yeah I- Islay re- region, yeah, it's the islands where they use more of that yeah, that that peated, uh, it- it's like a soil, you know. They use that to dry the barley. They they heat and dry the barley when it- after it's done fermenting, and it imparts those campfire notes into the whiskey itself. But the aging process is where you kind of discern and differentiate the different type of flavor profiles on the palate. So I, I don't mind a good smoky sea malt either. So it's so funny, you know, just 
thinking about this. You know, when we're younger, uh, we're excited to get a beer. And and then yeah. when we, we go to college or whatever job you're in, when you're, you're eight, between that 18 to the 23 year old, you're drinking beers a lot because it's cheap. Yep. And yep. You're, you're buying that, that plastic bottle vodka or tequila oh. because you could do a ton of shots of that, go into the party, all effed up. And then oh, um, man. you got that courage. Uh, but then as we get older, right? Um, we realize that the beer, I mean, hopefully you have that realization that that beer all the time is building a, a keg on your body. So you stick to some, some of the more spirits and then you get into the scotches and the bourbons and, and, and the cigars and you kind of, I mean, it's, it's, an, I, I've seen that evolution um, for me and for other people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, dare I say, dare I say it's, it's akin to any, uh, any amount of growth in life. If you really think about it, we're maturing in sophistication. We're learning how to expand our capacity and our palate and our ability to appreciate things that take craftsmanship to create. You know, when you're young, you're just, you're wild. You want to have a good time. You're not thinking about, again, my dad had scotches all around the house, but I never put two and two together of that is the kind of liquor I should be sipping. You know, at, at the same time, I'm an athlete, so I wasn't really drinking much. But when I would go to those high school parties every once in a while and sneak a beer, it was always like, you know, you got, the, it's the malt liquor type beers or it's the yes. champagne type beers. As you get older, just like anything in life, you, you know, you grow into that sophistication. You develop this new ability to appreciate more complex things. And whiskeys are a, a definitely a unique expression to kind of showcase that. Now, it's funny. I, I didn't say wine. I don't know why. I just, I'm not a wine guy. Nice. I don't know what it is. Uh, I just, I have never gotten into wine. Um, but anyways, you know, people always, I, I get these emails like, you know, you always start your show off. You're talking about food and drinking. Uh, that's probably because <laughs> I, I'm coming home from work and that's all I'm thinking about is food and, and drinking. Uh, yep. so, so Wiley, let, you know, uh, yeah. you have a podcast. How long have you been doing that podcast now? Uh, just started it. I want to say a year ago. Um, we did, I've got 26 episodes recorded. I took a hiatus. I had a, a death in the family this year. So I had to take a step back and kind of help, help out in that, that regard. But, um, we're kind of kicking it back off. I have, uh, some new episodes that are being produced right now. They're going to go out live the first of the year. Uh, the first one of the new year is going to be Esteban, who's a Spanish guitar icon. He came to the studio and recorded with him. So we're going to kick it back off next year. I've got a lineup of really cool guests, some former pro athletes, a couple generals and some other folks, some really cool, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, et cetera, uh, that want to come on and have some cool conversations. Just like you talked about, that's what it's all about is really sitting down. It's more of a passion project, you know, sharing a unique whiskey that I pick for my guest that matches their personality, matches what I want to talk to them about, bring them on. I kind of startle them with the idea of what we were going to discuss. And then we unpack it together, have an hour long, you know, wise words conversation for, you know, whatever information that comes out is natural, organic, and the audience gets a benefit from that rather than feeling, you know, overwhelmed with like, maybe I should take notes and learn something from this. They get to kick back, relax, pour one themselves and, and just tune into some, some people just having some cool conversations. So that's what it's about. And, and I can appreciate that because uh, like we just discussed, I, I love the whiskeys, whether it's American or Scottish. Um, and I know a lot of people in the shooting community and in the, the Leo yeah, Mill community, they all love their, their, their whiskeys and bourbons too. I mean, I think it's a daily thing we talk about at work. Um, so that's very cool. And uh, I'll link it below so people can go and check that out because appreciate it's always that. fun to learn. No problem. It's, it's, pre it, it's fun to learn about different whiskeys and then have a good conversation uh, along with it. Uh, right. So speaking of, right. <laughs> speaking of conversations, so you've got a very diverse background and you started off uh, going one way, right? And then you kind of mm -hmm. went somewhere else. So you started off and, <laughs> you know, I can relate to baseball because my kids, you know, knee deep in baseball and, and all the, the, the stuff in the, you know, the five different bags and not one bag is good enough yeah. to get a bigger bag. Uh, he's a catcher. He also likes to do some pitching. So it was exciting to, to talk to a pitcher. So what, what you went into baseball and, and what happened? I was born into it. Believe it or not, really? I, I truly was born into it. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. And I, I've shared this story before, but my dad, my father was a semi-pro ball player in the seventies. He played for the, uh, a team called the San Jose Bees, which is a, a farm team. Um, and he was an outfielder, center field, had a cannon for an arm, apparently, as I'm learning. Uh, you know, when I got older, as I was in baseball, learning that from his friends, et cetera. But 
I grew up in it. I'm the firstborn of uh, three boys, and my dad immediately, at like three years old, I was playing ball with him in the backyard, throwing a ball around, kind of recognize, I guess, recognize that maybe I might have some talent with that. And uh, I think four, I was on a t-ball uh, team for the first time. He put me on the mound. He's like, if I my son's got an arm, I'm gonna I'm gonna put him in a position that really where arm can be you know utilized. And then uh, little league started. I want to say a year or two later, and I was already pitching right out of the gate. And then, of course, because of my dad's contacts in pro baseball, you know, guys like Rod Carew and Bo Jackson, and, you know, things like that that I grew up around, Dennis Eckersley, Bert Blylevin, you know, from Anaheim, California. So I grew up around the Angels. Um, I got pitching lessons as I got older. I started to learn how to perfect my arsenal, and I played starting pitcher for like 12 years. And I was just a, just all we focused on. So aside from the fact that I played football off season. Uh, which I love to do as well. Baseball was my primary focus. So I was naturally just born into it. I didn't really get to choose that. And I think that's kind of why as I got older, I got into high school, it really became this question that I started to have with myself as you develop. Again, you mature of what is it that I really want for myself? Am I doing this because I like to do it and I want it? Or am I doing it because my father put me in it and I it's all I know and this is what I'm expected to do? So I started to have that kind of I want to say combative, you know, mental conversation as I got into high school. And then it eventually got to the point where I, I found myself steering away and looking for something else. That's really interesting because, um, I've, I've heard that on both ends that if you get into it super early, it, as you go on and on and on, it, it's no longer, like you said, yours, it's more like your parents or someone else's and be, you lose yeah. interest. And then the guys that came in later to it tend to to really, really, really want it. Um, so, at what point did you decide that it wasn't for you? You know, it, it's that's a good that that's a good distinction. I I did want it for a little while. I, I loved it, especially when I got I think at around set age eight or nine, ten years old, and I was really doing well in pitching. That's when I was getting my lessons from the Angels pitching staff. And I remember and nine, one of the moments eight and nine you were getting lessons eight, from the yeah yeah wow yeah just little little. One off lessons. My dad would take me there. He'd introduce me. We would spend a couple hours in the bullpen and we or in the pitching cages and it would teach me how, you know, to throw a new arsenal. I had a fastball and a slider, but I didn't know how to throw a curveball or I didn't know how to throw a knuckleball. So they were teaching me how to do that. But I remember at nine years old, my dad introduced me at a private book signing to Mickey Mantle. So that was like the ultimate thing though, where I got to meet this legend. And I realized I really do love this game. But I think what ended up happening was I wanted to play professional baseball. My dad said, hey, look, you stick to this, you train it year in and year out. There's a, you have a chance. We can get you scouted. I was a starting pitcher every single year, which was fantastic. And I'm very, very humbled every year I'd get picked to do that. And then my dad said, we get you scouted, go to the right college, and then we can get you ready for the big leagues. And I got to the point, it was in high school. It's almost like that, that desire, that perfectionism, that my dad pushing me really hard. Again, not he's not... He's not doing doing it to be mean, but he did it because that's what he he thought was possible for me. And he really he put me in a position where it didn't. As I got developed as a young man, I, I thought, well, how come if I don't do good enough, you know, if I don't get the A, so to speak, on, on the mound, then I I get I get reprimanded for it, and I've got remedial PT for it, and I've got to I've got to prove myself even more. And it started to feel like I'm playing this game for more of that approval, and it didn't really feel a hundred percent anymore like. I really felt this could be a career for me. That was high school. And in high school, you develop your personality, your clicks, you start to find out who your friends are, you start to realize what is it I want to explore, I want to get wild. And I started to rebel, push back against him. And I started to hang out with a guy that wore a cowboy hat. And he started introducing me to friends that his were pro rodeo cowboys. And it just became this like enticing world of, wow, rodeo seems different. I felt something inside me light up, you know, ignite inside me. And I thought, I want to know what, what else that feeling is. So I started to explore and started asking questions. Say, hey, I'd like to ride bulls. And they're like, hey, come out here this weekend. And we'll put you on the back of one. And I did at 16 years old. And the first time I ever rode a bull, I hit the ground. He fell on me. And I realized I want to do that again. It turned me on and made me feel alive in a way that I hadn't felt in a long time playing baseball, solely baseball. And I decided to pursue that. And my, of course, that created this stress and this fear and this worry in the relationship between me and my father and, of course, my brothers at the house. So I always had that that pit in my stomach when I go home. My dad was always stoic and he would be very disappointed in me. And I still found myself doing it anyway. And I felt myself growing despite being in that chaos or that discomfort, if you will. So that's high school was really the transitional point for me where I really fell in love with bull riding. It's kind of faded away from baseball. So while while you I just want to say one more thing with baseball. 
um, since yeah, you were sure. uh, doing so well. How how much did you practice for that? Ooh, it seemed like uh, almost daily. I mean, there was probably something I was doing on a daily basis. Now, I had an avid baseball card collection as a young man. Uh, that's one of my little off-time hobbies when I grew up in the 80s was trading baseball cards with my neighbors, you know, the kids in the neighborhood, finding ways to make new wheel and deal, you know, and I go to the store and I take my Beckett's and I, you know, I watch games. We had season tickets to the Angels. I go to the ravine to watch the Dodgers play. I go to Angel Stadium. We were always involved in baseball. So it was, I was consumed by it, but I was always at the batting cages. I was always somehow at the park playing catch with my friends for hours on end. I was always practice pitching, even if by myself, I would put like a, uh, a little uh, stand up with the net. And I would work on my target practice and I would work on my fundamentals and my mechanics and really get my body prepared for the next season. So it was always part of my life. It just became a natural just thing I did. I didn't think about it. It was I'd wake up on go train rest of the day doing whatever my parents wanted me to do, play video games on the weekend if I could, a Nintendo or something on Sunday, you know, and then train again. And that's that's the nature of how it was for a very long time. So you transitioned to bull riding. I can't imagine yeah. that you can practice bull riding at home unless you're riding one of your brothers. <laughs> Get on the ground, I'm put my rope around you. But no, you actually can. There are protocols and ways in which cowboys do work. Uh, their their skill sets when they're not actively engaged in a rodeo itself or in a competition. They have what's called barrel practice, where they tie a barrel up to four different ro ropes against trees that create some slack and you got your buddies the cowboys will pull on it and simulate a bull's movement and you sit on the back of it with your rope with a little pad that you know softens up that that impact of that barrel and you practice your leg placement your head placement your body posture and positions your arm your strength your balance arm bull riding is 80 percent legs believe it or not there's a lot of power that goes into your internal legs that you have to use to hook yourself into that animal to make sure that you can ride that animal now the arm stabilizes you and then you have a balance arm which is that free arm that helps equalize your ability to move around the pivotal axis of that bull when it's turning you know any direction with the shoulder movements it's back it's jumping it's coming down whatever you learn how to post coming up off the back of the bull and you learn how to sit back down on it so it becomes a a skill set you have to really refine and work even when you're not riding the bull so you find ways to exercise those those muscles and those skill sets well, I can't imagine something more terrifying because I've been up close to a bull. Um, I've watched <laughs> some videos before this interview just to see more bull riding. I mean, I've seen it, but yep. uh, it's insane. It is it is crazy. Now, in, in law enforcement, uh, one of the best ways for stress inoculation that they've said is taking the, the hit from the canine, right? You put the sleeve on. Uh -huh. And you let that dog right. come right at you and he, you know, he tries to rip your arm off, but it, it, it develops right. a stress inoculation. I can only imagine getting on top of one of these animals and then trying to ride it or stay on for dear life. That uh, what that does for your stress inoculation. It is quite fascinating. And we're all, obviously we're all different uh, in our own unique experiences when we're put in stressful situations like that. So I'm only speaking from my experience here, but. What I really fell in love with about bull riding was, yes, the riding was fun. I mean, I jump out of airplanes now. I have for the last nine years. I like to jump out of airplanes. I like to do you know more of those extreme type sports. It's just the nature of it is just exciting. The vulnerability of it is enticing. Bull riding for me introduced me truly at a young age of what it really meant to learn how to be focused in the most uncomfortable of situations when you don't have a lot of time to think. It's like, um, it forced me to learn how to be present with all aspects of myself as a human being, not just the thinking component of me, but my emotions. What are my emotions in, the, in these, these times of chaos that I know I'm about to experience with this 1,800 pound wild live animal underneath me that's going to come out, blow out here and try to throw me as hard as he can off of him, designed, raised to buck me off. What is it about intuition? How do I unite myself with this animal? How do I stay present? And how do I focus? Even though I might feel fear, even though I might feel uncomfortable, I might be worried, I might have everything going on in my head. It's like, it, it just forces you to learn how to be present. Just like skydiving forces you to learn how to be present. 
I, I loved that component of bull riding. I know that was me personally. And so every time I got the back of an animal, I would breathe with the animal. I'd feel its life underneath me. I knew what it could do to me. It didn't matter. There was this yielding to the fear of the unknown of what could happen when I ride him so that I could actually experience more of a, I would say, a calm, collected presence when the gate opens up and it's time for us to get out there and get it done. So I, every time I broke away from that focus is when I ended up you know, having a crappy ride and I, I get slammed on the ground, I get hurt. I'd have to run out and feel embarrassed because I just did something stupid. But anytime I really brought myself center, every time I get in the back of the animal in the back of the chute and those guys were tying my rope and I'd say, I would just connect with the animal. I'd be present. Maybe I'd say a prayer or meditate for just a split second. I focus on my breath and I realize, you know what? The unknowns don't matter. There's, there's so much that could happen. If I focus on here and not the unknowns, I ended up having a better ride. Sometimes I'd end up covering the bull for eight seconds and doing really well. So I, I, that's what I loved about bull riding, me personally. So you, you went to high school, um, you enlist <laughs> in the army. What, what was the, what was the reason behind all that? So I have a legacy military family. My grandfathers are both D-Day vets. My mom's dad was an Army Air Corps, flew bombing runs over Normandy. My dad's dad was a signalman in the Navy. He, he was uh, part, part taking part responsibly for the naval gunfire that pounded the Nazi bunkers on the shores of Normandy. Um, my uncles were all military from Army and Navy. My dad was a corpsman before Vietnam. My, both my uncles that I remember were special forces in Vietnam. One of them was Mac D. Sog, which is a very unique group of, of guys that did what they did over there. My stepdad's Desert Storm. I have a, just a really rich military family. Even subsequent family members were all military. And then my brother, middle brother, and I decided when we were, I think, in junior high and early high school, I think eighth and ninth grade together. And um, hey, we want to go do like this junior Marine Corps program. And we were at a boxing club in West Anna or East Anaheim where, where we boxed. And one of the gunnery sergeants was a trainer there. He said, hey, I, I do a program for the devil pups. And he's like, I'd love to have you guys. So we trained for 12 weeks at El Toro Marine Base. We learned all the military structures. We went to a two-week boot camp where we got to live down in Camp Pendleton at this young age. And it, it's like, it really made us realize that so, service to our country is so honorable and so necessary. And it just felt like, let's go do something really meaningful. We didn't think about money. We didn't think about college. We, we just like, let's go serve like our family did. Let's go do something cool. You know, what do you want to do? You know, his, his dream, his idea was, hey, I'm going to go to go into the Navy and go to Butts, be a SEAL. And I was like, great, I'm going to go to the Army, be a Ranger. Let's go do that together. And, you know, things changed through that path. But I joined the Army in high school, 1997, in my you know, some junior in high school. And I went to boot camp between my junior and senior year, came back, did reserve uh, training. So I was an active reserve and during high school because I wanted to get an experience before I went active duty. And then when I gra was getting ready to gra graduate, I decided to go infantry, to go active duty, to get out and go become uh, part of something bigger. And uh, that's when I left high school and right into the five and a half years of active duty with 101st Airborne Division. So you you did the devil pup thing. Why didn't you go into the Marines? I don't know. Just uh, the, Marine, the Marines, I think the Marines, you know, right. I think, and my, my Marines buddies would laugh at this. I think the Marines, though, at the time, were not guaranteed any jobs. So for me, I thought, well, I, I'm not going to get put in here and be a big wheel mechanic. You know, I want to, I mean, to me, it's like, I want to carry a rifle. I want to jump out of airplanes and I want to go do really cool, fun, you know, a crazy stuff. Let's, I'm young, dumb. Let's go get it. The army was guaranteeing a job. So I think that's where I looked at it. Like, Hey, would you want airborne in your contract? We can do that for you. Let's go. And I thought, well, what's, what do I have to do? Like you'll be 11 X-ray airborne. We'll sign you up. I'm like done. I think that's why I decided to go army because the Marine Corps, the Marine Corps was great. It just didn't guarantee me something that I really wanted. And that scared me. I was like, yeah, I don't want to be thrown in a, you know, an MOS that I'm probably not going to be happy with. So we ended up in the army. So you went, you went, <laughs> excuse me, no problem. You went into the 101st uh, initially, or did you have to uh, work your way? Cause you said you wanted to be a ranger and I did. And yeah, that's a story. I, I think it was shared with uh, another gentleman about this, but when I joined the army and I got my airborne contract, I got to boot camp, graduated, turned blue, which is where you get your blue cord to become an infantryman. It's a ceremony day, the rite of passage for us. And then the infantryman is a basic where you start out and you can branch out and go into special forces or army rangers. You can go off and do all this really cool stuff. Not to say the infantry isn't cool, 
But when uh, about eight or nine of us were at boot camp, we got done. They said, hey, let's go do your airborne physical. We're like, great. We're getting ready to go to airborne school. Jumps. They came back three days later and said, hey, needs of the Army just called. They have to push a bunch of West Point cadets that just graduated through airborne school to get them to their units. And the only slots they have available are coincide with your slots that have to go to school. So we're going to have, you're going to have to sacrifice as these new privates coming in the army for these West Point officers, your slots. Now they did say, Hey, it's kind of a breach of contract. You guys want to get out because we, 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 we can't just take your, your slot from you like this, but we have to do it for the needs of the army. And I thought, you know, I just didn't go through my second round of boot camp to quit. I was like, screw it. I'll just deal with it. And then if I decide to stay in, I'll ask the army to give it to me when I relist. That was just my logics. So when I got my orders, I was the only one that got the orders to the 101st Airborne Division at boot camp. And the drill sergeants were like, hey, man, at least you're going to get air assault school. I was like, cool, I'll go get at least a school out of this. That's how I got to the 101st. And when I got there to serve with the 187 Infantry Rocket Sons, uh, they were like the HUA Long Lost Ranger Brigade. I thought, well, 60% of the people here have tabs, all Ranger qualified guys. I'm like, well, I'm sure in the right place to make sure I can get to Ranger school and then eventually get down to Ranger Battalion. But again, as time would have it, you know, I go on my first deployment to Kosovo, I get home, I do my EIB, I get my EIB, which is your expert infantryman's badge. I was like, hey, I want to re-enlist. And they're like, what do you want? I'm like, airborne school. The airborne school, I can get that, and it'll qualify me. And then I can go train to go to pre-ranger, ranger school, and eventually get to ranger battalion, which at the time, my middle brother was at first of the 75th Ranger Regiment. He ended up telling the Navy to go kick rocks because... He was an all-state wrestler, had a little bit of like cartilage damage in his knee, and the Navy said, well, we don't think you'll make buds. He was like, well, screw you. I'm going to go to the Army Special Operations Community. He became a Ranger, and I was trying to get down there with him. So it just became this needs of the Army thing where kind of once you get into that pipeline, sometimes it becomes a really hard thing to, to, to move through ambitiously to get to the schools you really want, especially when you're a, you know, a young specialist, non-commissioned officer, corporal like I was. Um, a lot of leaders don't really want you to go anywhere, especially if you're contributing something really well to the team. I was on a small uh, mortar team, 60 millimeter mortar team, and I was doing really well. So, of course, they don't want to let go of a good soldier. And so it became this like fight. Uh, and I just served there my third combat tour in Iraq. They were like, hey, do you want to relist? I said, look, I can't, if you can't give me Ranger School, make sure I get promoted. I, I don't want to stay in. And they're like, we could probably do that, but you have to sign up for another six years. And I thought, man, I'm in the, in the middle of a year long combat rotation. You've already screwed me twice on a reenlistment and an enlistment. I don't, I don't trust you. So it just got to the point where I never really had to fulfill that ranger. That's fine. I totally understand. I got to do really cool stuff. I did operations with rangers and, and green berets and seals overseas. I got to experience some of the cool stuff that they do. I was okay with that. So for the listeners that, that don't know, um, you're the 101st Airborne Division. Everyone here also has heard of the 82nd Airborne Division. So, so, what what are the differences between the two and 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 yeah what is airborne? So you, it's funny. I was on uh, Citizen with Dan Holloway, and he the first thing he said out of, out of the door was like, "I just want to make a distinction. Hunter First is not an actual airborne unit. Yeah, the eighty the second is." The, and, and we laugh because that, that is a thing. It's like the only unit division that has an airborne tab above its patch that is not holistically still airborne like it was during World War II and Korea, uh, Vietnam, et cetera. Airborne is combat operations utilizing air airplanes, the platform of an airplane and a parachute. To, it's an infiltration tactic that they use to drop troops behind enemy lines. So it's a combat tactic of, of insertion during combat operations. I think we had a couple combat jumps during the GWAT era. Uh, I think the 82nd and the Ranger Regiment did it as well. But um that's that's what they do, and they do it at low altitudes with these big round parachutes. I think they're square, a little more square now, but they drop you at you know, altitudes of a thousand to fifteen hundred feet, so it's very low to the ground. It's static line, so the static line is automatically pulling your parachute out of the the rig for you, so you don't have to worry about pitching your parachute. Uh, you you count to four, you look up, you control your risers the best you can, you hit the ground, I don't know, ten feet per second. You grab your gear and you you huck it. So that's designed to get people into combat very fast very effectively. And it was, uh, so we have the, the Leveth airborne, I think is Antarctica 173rd in Italy. you got the 82nd airborne at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. The 101st was an airborne unit, but they deactivated it and turned it into a, an air assault division, which is where we use helicopter platforms to air assault troops into hostile locations where we get to repel, uh, land the aircraft and do different types of, uh, sling load operations with equipment. So that's why even though 
they didn't take away the airborne tab. It's still known as the 101st Airborne Division for its prestige. It's one of the most storied, probably the storied, most storied unit in the entire world with its history in combat. They're not going to take that away from it. Despite the fact that it does have 5th Special Forces Group on post, it has the alerts unit up there, which is Long Range Surveillance Detachment. You have other active duty elements inside the division, but it's not overall an actual airborne unit like the 82nd. So here's a question for you. In in the yeah. modern military and looking at wars that are going on and could potentially go on, is there room for an airborne division? Is Is that still something necessary to drop troops in? I mean, because we've got planes, we've got lots of missiles, we've got tanks, we got all these things. Are we still going to be dropping yeah. soldiers down like that? What what are your thoughts yeah. on that? It's a very effective tactic. That's why we have so many different groups that utilize that tactic for infiltration. The Navy SEALs use it. Uh PJs do it as well. You have the the combat controllers do it. The Rangers are known they're airborne rangers for a reason. Special Forces community uses it. You have different types. You have your static line jumping, which is your low altitude, quick insertion tactic for airborne operations. And you have your free fall uh, operations, which is your military free fall, where they're going to more what people, the average person will call halo. So you get the guys that go up and actually pull their own parachute, uh, uh, pilot chute, and, and they control their own more rectangular sport type canopy. But those those are operational tactics are necessary. We have all of those other elements you mentioned, but they're always going to be in need number one for ground troops in any conflict. I, I don't care about AI or any kind of the technology that everybody's talking about. Oh, it's just going to be a complete tech. No, it's not. We're always going to need troops. We may spend more time softening up the targets before we set in boots on ground, but I think air assault and airborne operational tactics are always going to be needed for very specialized missions. They're going to be ops that people are going to need to go out. We're going to like, hey, how do we get in here? We can't drive a truck in here. They're going to see us. We can't swim in here because it's probably... The canal is probably blocked off. We can't go over here and do this type of like rucking ourselves in there. Maybe they might get, uh, you know, hit contact on the way in there. Well, we've got, we can jump in. Okay, great. Let's see the terrain. Let's see the conditions. Let's figure out where we're going to go. And that might be the best answer for whatever op that these individual groups or units might be needing to go on when it comes to war. So warfare is always, I think, always going to need air war. I think it's just a really well put together tactic and it does, it works really efficiently, especially at nighttime. So I, you're out of the service now, correct? 20 years. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to ask you this question. Um, I, I was watching a statistic today on on a news show in the morning, drinking coffee, and they were talking about um, military recruitment and uh -huh. goals that are, are not being met by any of the services. The one nope. that was higher than most of them, surprisingly to me, was the Army. They are yes. way below their numbers in terms of recruitment. <clears throat> yes. What, what is it about the army that is making it so hard for them to recruit people right now? As a uh, truly, I, I'm going to be candid about it. It's their woke ideologies and policies that they are implementing. They're, it's the preference of people's feelings over the, the whole point of being in the army, the tactical aspect of being a soldier, serving your nation. It's like, we're more focused on how, how we're not going to offend people rather than on war fighting. And that, I think that's, and they're starting to slightly, I mean, dare I say, slightly wake up to their mistakes with the whole COVID situation and the vaccine that they did. They kicked out 8,000 decorated GWAC combat veterans and their families because they didn't want to take the vaccine. And now they're going, oops, sorry about that. Hey, you guys want to come back in? And everybody's like, are you joking me? So it, it is just eroding from the inside because we have weak leadership. In the big conventional army, we have people that are joining for the wrong reasons. We have the younger generations that that are disillusioned when they join. I, I saw something today myself that said Gen Z TikTok influencers are telling people not to join because of the quote low low wages, you know, poor food, you know, bad housing, and the broken promises. And it's like, what do you think you were getting into? The, I mean, you're, it's just like Club Med. You're joining the army. It's completely different. See, if you can't figure out how to make it work, you shouldn't even be in the military to begin with because even being a soldier, dealing with those low pay, you know, not so great food, maybe the MREs, maybe your barracks aren't like a mansion, but learning how to problem solve, even in that situation, is part of being in the army. Learning how to 
financially figure things out is part of being a soldier. It's not just going in wearing a uniform and hopefully you get to go to combat. It really is a holistic thing. And I think the sad part about it is now we got veterans coming out and and they're telling everybody to avoid military service. And I I understand it as a vet. Um, I, I, I get it because I kind of got stonewalled by some leadership before I got out in uh, December 2003. But at the same time, as a patriot, kind of looking at it like, well, how do we expect to fix our military, truly fix it in a reverse course if we don't have people willing to step up and actually get back into the fight to fix it? It's easy to bitch and complain on social media, on podcasts, and talk about it, how bad it is and why people should avoid service. But who's going to step up and go, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sacrifice and I'm going to get back into the game a little bit because I, I see where I could potentially help turn the ship around. And if we get more patriots like that, they're saying, hey, I'm willing to do it regardless. I think that's where we can fix it. Try to hope that we're going to vote in someone in the political theater that's going to somehow at some point try to disassemble the dysfunction from the outside in of what's going on in the army or across the military in general is the problem in itself. And how do you solve a problem if you avoid a problem? You can't. A lot of people are avoiding the problem by saying, don't do it. And I'm looking at it going, well, maybe we might need to. Maybe we might need to step up and, 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 and understand that selfless service means we sacrifice a little bit for the sake of what we say we stand for. And I, so I'm, I'm, I'm already in that kind of thought process right now at, at my age going, you know what, like who's going to, who's worth their salt going to step up and fix it. And we just going to bitch about it or are we going to do something? Where do we actually put ourselves in action to change that whole paradigm so we can actually still have a fighting force worth it that, that matters that it protects America. Now people are going to say, well, Wiley, I hear you say that, but you know, that you're, you're going to be fighting for global elitists. You're going to be fighting for this stupid administration and their, their policies. You're going to be fighting for all these rich people. It's like, we, we've always done that. Every war since the beginning of time has always had some element of that and involved in it. You're crazy to think it doesn't. When my gut buddies and I, everybody I served with, all the guys you're seeing now on these podcasts all around that served, we never joined it thinking that's what we were doing. We did it for people back at home, for the patriotic nation of honoring our country, serving our country, doing something bigger than ourselves. It was never a thought of like, I'm doing this for the, the government and their, their global agenda about making money. So I, I, I can go on and on with that, but that, that's the point where I'm at right now. It's like, you know what? It's broken and people avoiding it is not going to fix it. You've got to confront it. Warriors confront things. They fix things head on. They don't avoid it. And I think we need to shake up more warriors and say, hey, where can we rally together, create a consortium? Do we go back into the military for a little bit? Or do we figure out a way to consult with the military or find our ways in our leadership position to impact the military, to change and shake it up a little bit? And that's where I'm coming to the table with. So when I was growing up, uh, the end of Vietnam and the military had a bad stigma to it, but you had people who served there, served in Vietnam, and they had that experience. And then we got into a generation that uh, went into the military, uh, very dedicated to it, but because of circumstances, a lot of those people from Vietnam eventually uh, retired out, and you were left with a, a group of people who uh, never never were in combat. And then, you know, we had some iffy type you know, combat. We had like Grenada and, right. you know, we had, you know, well, special uh, operations did that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yep. Right. Some Panama stuff, some Somalia stuff, uh, but nothing until nine 11. Then you had people coming into the military who were like, you know what? I got to make a difference. I, this doesn't sit right with me. And they were pushed. And actually before I'm, I, I'm wrong before that we had the, the, the first Iraq war. And desert you had people storm, yeah. all of a sudden, yep. Desert Storm, you had people who were like, oh, wait, this is the military. Oh, wow, look, there's tanks. There's, oh, but I mean, it, it wasn't a cakewalk, but uh, it wasn't, you know, the second uh, Gulf War with F and, and Afghanistan after 9 11. But you had a lot of determined people. You had a lot of people now that had that combat experience. Now you're having, yes. like you're saying, the woke uh, influence. You have people who are Gen Z who are in there who don't have it. And then the good people have been leaving or have been kicked out because they wouldn't get the vaccine. Right. right. I worry what's going to happen it? if we're put to the test again, because everybody was concerned when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. We we're like, oh crap. Is it? 
the big bad Russians are coming to take on this this ragtag yeah. country that's full of problems. But Ukraine has, sh- you know, they've gone through a lot of the, Russia was, wasn't as, as impressive as like in the 80s when I was growing up. Like, like, oh crap, you know, the, the Russians, you know, uh-huh. we need Rambo to go and, and fix them. Uh, yeah, they right. were, <laughs> they were scary. Now they're like, you know, they're throwing people in, you know, you go to prison or you go into the army, you know, and people are defect. I mean, it's just, it, they've taken such losses over Ukraine. So that's my concern. I don't know. I don't know. Do you have these kinds of thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. I do have those thoughts. I, I, and you, you're, you're making good points with it. If you consider the era of patriotism from at post Vietnam and Korea, you get into that desert storm era, people are waking up and going, wait a minute. There was, there was, we were united, truly. I mean, there are factions of people that, you know, again, we're always going to have factions of naysayers in anywhere you go in any culture, any community, society, but we were united. I mean, I, I just comes to mind is Whitney Houston singing the national anthem, right? The Super Bowl. That was one of the most patriotic moments. I think we, we remember of that era, but the, the flyovers, we were united for a common focus and a common good. We had values and principles, standards. We have public decency and decorum. All of that now is so eroded. It's so gone. We are so divided. I think I heard Mike Lover and Andy Stump uh, and Evan Hafer, those guys that uh, kind of talking about it on one of their shows or whatever today. And um, I got to talk about this when I was on Andy's show as well earlier this year, but they were discussing how we are the most divided. Andy said, we're the most divided we have ever been. He's like, why do our, our, our adversaries don't need to send in militaries? They can sit back and use social media and, and hit a button and look what they've done to us. Now, the problem also is I think we are experiencing also these younger kids that were babies and young little children at the time of the participation trophy era where everybody's feelings matter. Everybody got to, got to, you know, experience the winner's mindset, even if they didn't lose. We, we started to kill competition. We started to kill out the patriotic values that made us unique as the United States of America. The GWAT era of guys my age that served, we were all looking at it as like, well, we got hit in in the face. September 11th, everybody was like, you did that to us. It wasn't a selfish, you did that to me. And now that's what we're having right now. Everyone's selfish. We have a very self-centered, look at me, narcissistic, vanity-driven society with phones in their faces, you know, the stress, the, the those little stress boxes that people carry around, they have, and they're panicked about things and they're being fed information and it's further breaking their ability to focus, concentrate, and actually appreciate what they actually have in front of them. Those are the people that are unfortunately left in the pool to serve our country because a lot of us, a lot of guys my age are combat veterans with certain disabilities. So they're like, they did 20 years. They've seen enough combat for four lifetimes. And the idea of going, hey, well, we got to get more patriots like that back in, but we don't have the pool of them. What do we do? And I think that's the scary part. So I have that conversation with myself, my wife all the time. And I've even thought about it too. I'm like, do we, some of us need to go back into the military for another tour? Do we have to just go serve and at least put ourselves back into that space? Bring a little bit of something back into the mix, challenge the status quo that's happening right now to maybe redirect it into, even if it's one degree, I don't know. But again, these are, these are more broader conversations to have with other people. It's scary. It is scary. It is scary, especially when you're considering who's staying in, who's getting out. And that's kind of what happens is the good people get out and the bad people stay in. And then here, here's where we're at. How would that work? Uh, you going back in? <laughs> I mean, would you doable. be able to? It's doable, doable. You, but you you can go back into your position, or would you have to start from the beginning again? Well, so it's interesting. Is I I I will I haven't declared this really to many people, but I have been debating that. I have already been talking to an army recruiter. Now I'm forty forty four years old. So, um, but I I. Physically, I'm in a position where I, I, I'm training. I'm still training right now to this day. I carry rocks in the mountains where I live in Sedona. I go to the gym every morning at 4.30. I'm there training with heavy weights. I'm doing cardio. Uh, I, you know, I'm able to, again, I have more improvements to make, obviously, before I could ever potentially get to where I want to go. But I told, talked to a recruiter. I said, hey, here's where I'm at. I have worked in my business for the last 14 years. I'm kind of thinking like something's going on in our country. Perhaps there might be a chance for me to go serve again. In a very specific, you know, position, uh, is it possible? They said yes, it is. You are. We can age waiver you, 
So what they would do is subtract your active duty that you already served minus your biological age. That gives you your, what they call service age. Then they waiver that. Then medical through MEPS, they say, hey, as long as you can pass our medical evaluations and our PT tests, we'll send you back. Um, yes, I would have to actually go back through boot camp all over again. So it's funny. I laugh. I'm like, that'd be the third time. However, because I'm a veteran, the when I talk to some drill sergeants that I know, they're like, look, when we get combat vets decide to come back in because some do go back in in their 40s. There are guys going in right now in their 40s. You know, we treat them differently. You still have to show up and check the boxes and do the training, kind of get, you know, refreshed on the new protocols because things have changed after 20 years of war in Afghanistan. There are things you need to relearn or just recall on. No problem. But you get your own room. We kind of put you in leadership positions. We we expect you to show up and teach these young guys and gals or whatever your, your MOS is going to be, uh, you know, what it means to, to, to be a soldier, helping them out, being kind of like a mentor for the drill. I said, oh, that's pretty cool. I can, I, I, I'm happy to do that. It's not a problem. I love the training. I love to shoot. I have no problem with that whatsoever. But um, the conversations I'm having with some people that I know in the community right now uh, are the focus would be for me is to train and to get back into the army with an 18x contract and go into the special forces pipeline. So I would that's that's really where I would want to go because that's the environment where I could operate on a very exclusive team. I'd have more latitude for bringing some of my experience and expertise back into into the military. Uh, the promotional aspect is much more accelerated than the bigger army. I would have access to other opportunities because of that. So I'm just looking at how do I do that to inspire maybe some other vets I know that are thinking about it. So I, I'm having the conversation. It doesn't mean I'm going to go do it 100. percent It just means I'm I'm willing though. Truly, I'm willing to do it if I have to. I I, I it sounds I don't know. It's just it's a personal thing. It's not. It has nothing to do with me saying this out loud to make people think anything other than this is just a personal choice. I see where things are more slack and I'm feeling really, really bad about it. Uh, but I don't want to sit on the sidelines if there's something I can do about it. So I'm, I'm considering the option right now. So I'm exploring what's possible and it's possible. They just put a 40 year old, just graduated from the Q course, got his green beret. The oldest guy that they graduated was a couple years ago, 46 years old. It's like, it's possible. You just got to be physically fit, mentally sound and ready to go do it, but you can do it. Well, it's, it's very admirable that you, that you want to do that and, uh, put your career to the side and, and go back in uh, just to, to kind of, you know, and since we, we passed like the seven minute mark on YouTube, uh, unfuck people. So you can't really swear within the first seven <laughs> minutes of YouTube. Otherwise they, they push your, right? your content down. Yes, it is. So, but I know that's oh, your program, crazy. how to unfuck Dude. people. So I, I will say it. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's what it seems like it, that these people in, in, the, in the military who are worried about their pronouns as opposed to, you know, how I can better kill war somebody. Fighting. Yeah. It's war fighting. Like, yeah, I understand. Look, there are jobs in the military that are not, they're not war fighters. Now, it doesn't mean that you, every person picks up a rifle in boot camp and learns how to shoot a rifle. So worst case scenario, that cook at S1 clerk, they're going to need to know how to shoot a rifle. We've got to, we've got to utilize their body. But I think what ends up happening is like, well, I didn't join the army to be in combat arms. Okay, that's fine. But your feelings of your personal life should not affect the warfighter capabilities of the military and what we're actually here to do. It should be a, a, a apolitical environment, an apolitical community. We, I don't think we should have the military worried about whose president is what, what pronouns are here, how people, who, who they love and want to marry, all of these different aspects should not be. Now, I think we're also lacking massive amounts of faith in the military. I think people are very caught up in the selfishness aspect of thing there's a, it's very godless if you will and there's so much just dysfunction going on so that's another component we could spend hours on but it comes down to this like the unfucking aspect of things it, it's, even in the work i do it's nothing that i decided to do when i got out had anything to do with figuring out how to put people through another you know program what it was is like I at innately through my life experiences understand and can see and just know where and how to navigate someone's life individually with them. So when I am with a client or a, a friend or whatever it is, I can't help but see where it is I need to attack and go, this is what I need to unfuck and fix. So the work I do is very intimate. It's about being with that individual for a certain amount of time in their life with them. I live with them. I travel with them. I buy their side. I'm basically a battle buddy that's in the trenches like a soldier going, you know what? I'm going to constantly redirect you, kick your ass, 
make you face things you don't want to look at, battle them with you, the demons that plague you. And we're, and we're going to, and simultaneously, I've got a network of people that work in tandem with me that we can reorient your business, focus you on a new financial direction. We can optimize every component of who you are so that you can actually go out and experience the peace and the satisfaction and the fulfillment with all the things that you're doing rather than feeling like you're on a never ending roller coaster and you're struggling and you're stressed out, even though 30 years you've been a public figure doing XYZ. So I think the piece that's missing, I bring that up, is the piece that is missing is people are not fronting the dysfunction enough anymore in our society. When you confront someone, you said like YouTube, you say the bad word on YouTube, you get your, your wrist slapped. I'm sorry, but confronting people is love. Confronting dysfunction and, and pushing up against someone who's trying to make it normal and trying to tell you, gaslight you into believing that the, the dysfunction and the dissolution that they're experiencing is a reality and you have to adhere to it despite what you might believe, think, feel, or agree with, to me is the reason why we're in the position we're at and why our enemies are taking advantage of that. It's at the end of the day, people are afraid to confront each other. And now what's interesting, brother, is people are so used to the phony nature of another human beings. Everybody's so phony with each other that any kind of real, direct, clear communication feels like an aggressive attack. It comes across now to people as you're aggressive and all you're doing is I'm just being real with you. I'm just telling you the truth. You may not like that crap, but at the end of the day, I'm willing to confront. I'm willing to face. I'm willing to fight demons. How about you? Are you willing to do it? And if you're not, then get the hell out of the way. And that's, I think that's the piece that we're missing is getting people to discern when to confront, when to, to back off. And people are just avoiding it at all costs. And then they're turning around and wondering why there are, you know, things are unhappy and people are also more freaked out. And there's so much anxiety mental health issues going on. It's because there's no containment. There's no confrontation. People aren't being told no. They're not being slapped on the wrist. Someone's not getting punched in the face for disrespecting a, an elderly woman. I mean, we're not doing the things that really used to hold us together as a nation, the discipline that matters. So you you were in combat, three tours. Yes. Um, yeah. Let's just talk briefly about your first combat tour, your, your first day, your first time in combat. What was that like? How did you handle the fear? What did you have fear? You know, it's, it's, it's so my first deployment was I volunteered to go to Kosovo when I was 20. I was with, when I got to Fort Campbell, I was with the, what's called the battalion mortar platoon. So the 80 millimeter, uh, 81 millimeter mortar platoon. So there are four guns and an 81 millimeter mortar platoon. We are a company sized support element. So we're the indirect fire infantrymen that we cover with these big guns. Basically, the company uh, 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 movements in combat. So we're, that's what we're designed for. We're the, the call for fire guys. I walked into the CP one day, which is a, co a command post or a control point, wherever you want to call it. I walked into the CP one day, and my platoon started to say, hey, we need a volunteer. I don't know why. I felt this like need to throw my hand up. And I'm like, what am I doing? Because you don't just volunteer in the military for anything you don't know. It's coming your way. You just got to go, what am I doing? I just threw my hand up. He's like, great. You're transferring over to 1st Battalion in the 60s over there at Alpha Company, uh, you're going to go to Kosovo with them. And I was like, that was probably one of the best random throw my hand up for a volunteer in the Army thing I ever thought I could do. So I ended up transferring over there and going to Kosovo with them in 2000. So right after we did that whole you know uh, bombing campaign with uh, Clinton did in 78-day thing in 19 1999, and we were tasked with the Operation Joy Guardian. We worked with NATO, uh, the humanitarian aid, peacekeeping, but there were other things that we were doing and going on in Kosovo. We were doing covert reconnaissance operations in to the, the, the demilitarized zone inside Serbia. We're catching the Serbian mop. We're, I did stuff like that. So my very first operation in, in Kosovo like that, I went on a 10-man team. We were inserted. We walked for seven hours at night until the sunrise into this mountain range, three miles, in, uh, three kilometers into the no, no military zone inside Serbia, where there had been reports and intelligence that we had. Again, there were the, these Serbian fighters that were still killing civilians. They were still doing things out in the middle of the of the forest in the woods. And we ended up fighting them and we ended up setting up a, a like a control point, a choke point with them. Five guys on one side, five guys on the other, camouflaged ourselves, sat in the woods. They didn't even know we were there. And I remember 2.30 in the afternoon, I was the only one awake. Four, three guys behind me were sleeping on the side of this hill. I had my camo net in front of me. My, the lieutenant with me, I um, uh, was carrying the radio, sat on my side and we heard this noise. And I remember the sputtering noise of a truck coming up the valley, going in and out. And I just, nudged the lieutenant and he looks at me and I just gave him the, the hand signal to, to pay attention. So he started listening and he goes, okay, something. And he looked back at me and then 
a few seconds later, there was a guy who walked up with an AK-47 at the ready. And instantly right there, I thought, okay, something's about to go down. So I had my M4 and I, I'm sitting behind this camel. And again, we're camouflaged. You can't see us. We're wearing all of our, our jungle stuff. Um, we're in a good spot. We have five guys on one side, five guys on the other. And we're at a point where if we get if this thing pops off, we're sitting pretty. We're going to be fine. We'll be able to take out the enemy. We'll be good. 12 of these guys show up. There's 12 of them following this truck. And they're all carrying AK-47s. They're all at the ready as if they're preparing for something going on. And I vividly remember them fanning out and looking around the area, kind of doing their own checks. And this one guy walks up on the side of the hill. It's a very steep hill. And I have my M4 pointing at the, at the camo net. And I just remember thinking to myself, take a breath. If things go south, you, they go south. It's your training. You're here. This is what, what you're supposed to do. And I think in that moment, I had fear, but I allowed, I used that fear to further help support my ability to stay focused and calm because I understood, number one, my buddies required of that. And it was, I was thinking about these guys to the left and right of me, the guys across from me. And I'm the first one that's catch, catching a whiff of these guys. And this dude walks straight up to the camel net with his weapon. And he starts leaning in and looking around. And he, I swear, he had blue eyes. It was a, the eeriest thing. I had blue eyes and kind of light blondish, sandy blonde hair coming out of this like dirty hat that he was wearing. And he was scanning around. It had no clue. I was literally mere feet away from him. None whatsoever. And I felt my heart in a way that I had never felt pounding in my chest. I'm 20 years old. I'm going, this, this is surreal in my head. But all I could think about is rotating my selector switch to fire. I had my finger pretty prepared and ready to go. My weapon was basically engaged on him. But he turned around. So then we ended up calling air support. These guys were walking around the area. We called air support. I got on the radio. We threw on some infrared beacons to, to let the Apaches that showed up with the Kiowa Warriors. Hey, this is where we're at in these, the woods, guys. You know, if you guys got to engage with your guns, do not shoot us. So we had our, our IR on. And then I was on the horn with these Apache pilots, kind of whispering in whisper mode, telling these guys where these dudes were located, watching them walk around. So we ended up basically avoiding an international incident by not getting into a firefight. However, at the same time, we were able to capture a lot of intelligence and get these guys arrested figure out what's going on. They had this huge encampment that they were doing where they were, they were taking out Banians and torturing them. I mean, we were able to be able to do something very meaningful for that operation overall. But that first experience to me was like one of the most interesting, exhilarating, real world. Like it, 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 I think it clicked hours later when I was sitting on my cot back at our firebase. Like that could have gotten nasty. And I talked to my command sergeant major and he goes, I'm curious. Why didn't you? Why didn't you engage? Our OE stated if they had a weapon system, you had every right to open fire, and that's true. We had every right to shoot them. But I said, you know what, Sergeant Major, I got to tell you, I'm an E3. I'm a PFC. I'm 20 years old. I was like, it's not that I'm afraid of that. I actually almost did that because when I picked my weapon up at one point, the LT had put his hand on my barrel and, and like shook his head, no, don't do that. So I thought, okay, but I think it was that moment where you discern what's it worth. Do I engage in a gunfight right now and really make things bad? Or are we here on a covert reconnaissance mission to gather intel and figure out the bigger picture here? And I think it was the first time I got to experience a situation where it's either, it's choose either the, the who will gun host stuff where I can go kill somebody because everybody thinks infantry, you know, you guys kill people for a living. Say, yeah, great. That's, that's part of the job if we have to, but that's, that's not the only job we have. You know, there's, there's so much more. Or multifaceted. I think that gave me the ability to trust my gut, to trust my instincts, pay attention to when and how I'm going to perform and operate in those types of situations. And I held on to that moment for the rest of my my time in the military so that when I got to Afghanistan in 01 and I got into my first combat operation in the mountains of Afghanistan, got into a little skirmish with the Taliban, it's almost like it just naturally came back. And in that moment, I knew I have to engage. This moment, I'm sending more rounds downrange. I'm shooting my M4 when I need to. So it's beautiful because it, it taught me a lot about fear and how to use fear as an ally and how to help help yourself deal with emotions and the mental, I would say, race that goes on in your head when you're facing a, a situation that's very uncertain for you and scary. And if you can utilize that fear, if you learn how to lean into the fear rather than run away from it, I think fear serve a very serious purpose for your performance and really help you be able to focus and optimize so much more of your ability to handle whatever you're dealing with than it would be if you were to try to avoid it or, you know, get it off of you at all costs. That that's to me was for the rest of my life, that'll be an experience I'll never forget. To use the term fear as an ally, that sounds like 
sounds like something that that you definitely put into your program because it already has uh, a, a name for it. Fear is your ally. Um, how do you get better performance out of people? Because I, I know that's part of what you do. So what what are you doing to 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 get that that higher level yeah. of performance? So I do I I, I do want to clear is the work that I I do is not a, an actual program. So there's nothing that's cookie cutter, nothing that's laid out prior to the client working, you know, writing a check and and deciding to do the work. It is it is truly a relationship based immersive experience. They don't even know what they're going to get. All they know is when I, I'm introduced to them through a third party, which is usually what happens is people that I may have known or somebody I've worked with, they notice what happens to that person. What are you doing in your life? This is the guy I was telling you about. And it just becomes an intimate connection where I get to know that individual. Hey, I really want to explore what it might be like working with you. I see what you did with so-and-so. And I might spend a few weeks upwards of several months with that individual, just calibrating to get to know each other, building that just to make sure that they're, I want to, because what it does for me is it allows me to see how they interact with me. It allows me to see how they respond to certain things I might say in that time together, the things I might ask of them, because it's still a relationship. I want to see how they react to basically the leadership that they're going to experience, what it is I'm going to uh, potentially require them to do. I want to know where their resistance points are and how they're going to push back on me. If a simple little thing I might say, hey, you know what? You're telling me about your situation right now. We haven't even started working together, but you're telling me about it. Here's what I think you should do. Just go try and they go and they push back on. Now I know if I put them in a very intense situation when we're working together, what I'm going to get with that person. So it's called calibration before I just say, you know what? We're in a good place. We have now been flowing really well. It's time. And they go, yeah, I'm ready to finally jump. Let's go. That's when the check out. And then I end up living with them right out of the gate, a week, two weeks, a month, depending on what they need. I spend every day with them, but then they have me by their side for upwards of a year if need be, where I'm basically everything going on in their life, I'm right there with them. And I base I confront the stress. I fight them. I put them in positions out of their control that they don't like. It, it's it's not something I can describe here, even in this conversation. It is an experience in itself. However, it's a I had some clients say, look, it seems this seems like some military type style, like intensity, if you will, the way in which you are relentlessly not letting up, but how much I'm experiencing a change in my life because of it, it. It's almost like they're going through their own buds, their own ranger training, their own special operations like school, but in a very holistic way. I have a network of specialists from doctors to personal trainers that if I need them, I call them. They work in tandem with me with the individual as it's happening, as life is happening to that person. I bring them on board and we're constantly going at it every single day, if need be. 24-7, they have access to me. So it's like having that personal confidant in your pocket that you know, no matter what's happening, you can call three o'clock in the morning, I'm going to pick up the phone. You need me to fly out right now. I'm flying out right now. The investment they make is the only investment they make. And I turn around, I make an investment from that back in them with my resources. I sacrifice my life to make sure their life gets to where it needs to go. I'm like the operator that gets in, I unfuck them, and then I get out of their life. I get them to a place where you want to know how to up-level someone's performance, you've got to fight their demons. You've got to face with them the real nuanced areas of the life that's actually hindering. It's easy to go to a Tony Robbins seminar. It's easy to buy another book, read some more strategy. It's easy to hire David Goggins and go, to Jocko's muster. It's like, get motivated. You get all that good energy. And there's nothing wrong with those people at all. I'm not saying they don't have any value. But if you really want to know what you're truly made of, you got to get someone who is willing to get into the trenches, into your life, and go into the nuanced areas. The dynamic between you and your wife, the dynamic between you and your children, the dynamic between you and your money, how you interact with your employees, the way you interact with the world, how you you think you're saying one thing and really, really where it's coming from and how it's actually impacting your ability to make more money. Where are you actually lacking? What demons are plaguing you? You have stuck down for so long. They're festering, but nobody else wants to tell you about it. People are afraid that you might lose your shit if you poke at it. I'm the guy that I'm willing to do that. So that's how I up-level someone's performance is I get integrated into their lives with them and I fight them and I make them elite. I push them to a place they don't usually think they're, they're, they're capable of going. And I'm not a yes man. I get rid of the yes man attitude. Stop get hiring people that you can control. You want to know what it's like? Get someone you cannot control. Someone that's going to scare you, rattle you, shake you from within, 
but be by your side while it happens and not let you down so that you can get to the other side that you want to be. Well, I gotta tell you, I'm a little scared right now. Um, <laughs> uh, but this sounds like this would be a great oh, book. Man. Are you, are you writing well, the book? I, I think I told you, yeah, I think I told you at the beginning, aside from the memoir, everybody has been telling me for 10 years to write, which is War Was My Vacation. Uh, that's there. There's another one that uh, I've already laid out called the dark, the, it's, it's called the, the dark uh, force of success. What is it? No. Yeah, the dark force of high achievement. Why success is, uh, you know, um, yeah, it's like why success is, it's why success is killing you and how to save yourself. I'm sorry, but I kind of butchered that a little bit, but I'm thinking, what was that book that we were going to write? But yeah, it's the dark force of high achievement. Why success is killing you and how to save yourself. It's to discuss those very aspects of human beings and what they are unwilling to look at in their lives and why they need more than just therapy. Talk therapy does nothing to eradicate them. It just teaches you new tech uh, terminology that you turn around and use as a weapon to deal with, you know, people that you're, you know, you're, you're surrounding yourself with. Coaching nowadays is so fluffed up with so much marketing and everybody is now the expert and the specialist that has all the answers to make you 10x your business. And on top of that, make you better mindset, you know, make you better relationships, make you better at this. But at the end of the day, nothing's holistic. It's all compartmentalized, regurgitated nonsense that everybody repackages and resells to the same tune of the same drum. And I'm like, dude, we got to shake things up. You guys got to do something different. We are human beings. We're not these compartmentalized me mechanical things that just operate from a system. Da, 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 da. We are unique and dynamic. Your dynamics are where your real problems lie. Do you even know how to understand what a dynamic is and how it's affecting you? Well, find someone that does. So the book will be what shares a lot of those experiences working with these people for the last 14 years. Well, I think, Wiley, you, you definitely should get back in the military and and with your energy <laughs> and and your 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 knowledge, you you will definitely unfuck some of these guys and hopefully we'll get a, a better fighting force because God only knows what's around the corner. Um, I, I'd be blunt. If whoever's going to listen to it is military, I would really love, no disrespect to any of them, but I would love to see a lot of these warriors that have the ca capacity and capability to consider it, at least consider it. Because here's the thing, I talked to some folks, I talked to a colonel I know. Conscription is a, is a, it's, it's, it's no longer mums a word. Conscription is being talked about at the highest levels. There is a conversation and they're testing the waters in the media. They're going to throw it out there. Hey, possible military draft. They want to see how society reacts to that. If we don't have the force, what do you think they're going to do when we have to go to war with another superpower? If we have to fight another major conflict, they're not going to sit back and go, well, we don't, we can't do it. They're going to go, you know what? Hey, how about those GWAT veterans? Some of those guys aren't disabled. Let's go pluck them out. How about those guys over there? Let's go figure out we can get them back in. And, and honestly, that I would rather purposely go back in than get drafted back in and choose a job where I can go have the biggest impact and then get put in a position again where I don't have any choice. And I would love other veterans who are feeling some hole in their heart like I am to consider, at least consider, it, have conversations rather than just bitch about it. I think that would be a, a, a good start. Well, I, I don't want to, because I, I want to wrap this up, but I, I love that you sure. said that by the conscription because uh, I don't. I think there should be a mandatory national service when when you hit eighteen, um, like other countries have. I think that yes. that helps that 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 age group determine you know you know because they a lot of them don't know what they're doing and then they end up going to school or they don't go to school and they just end up doing stupid things and studying stupid crap. Um, I can say shit because <laughs> I already said fuck. Um, so <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but they got, but yeah, you don't yeah. have to go into the military. You can go into the police force. You can go in some sort of other just, civil service. Just that you're you're working, and everyone's doing it. It's not just certain people, but everybody's doing it. I think it it changes the psyche, and maybe you'll get rid of some of this crap that we have to deal with every day. Yeah, selfless service does a lot for the human being. I think people um, that's an undervalued com um, concept. You hear selfless service, people don't know really know anymore what that means. I truly feel that selfless service has allowed me to grow better as a man and as just as a person, because I know what it, what it feels like. A lot of vets, we all, you do, I, we all know what it's like to sacrifice the, of the self for the greater common good. We you know what it means to, to suck it up and just deal with certain hardships. Yeah. I mean, you, you, at the end of the day, it's like, okay, you got some food on the table. You got a cot to lay on. Dude, you're better than the a vast majority of some of the people on this planet. 
let's let's see the blessings even in those moments rather than seeing blessings only happening to us when we're wealthy and we've got the Instagram photos and we're traveling. But how about we appreciate, I think that would change the mindset of so many of these younger generations when if we had other older leaders, veterans, et cetera, would teach them what selfless service really means and how it actually can help boost your career, help boost your viability, your capacity, and to perform at a higher level when you get done. It's amazing how you can make more money, you have more opportunities, people respect you more, things change in the dynamics. But if, until we get these people out of their phones and, and, and away from the selfishness and understanding what selflessness really means, we're going to keep going down this. We're going to, this maelstrom is never going to end. And that's, that's the problem I think we're facing, which I really am hoping we have people willing to step up and fight to change it. Amen, brother. Um, so it's Wise Words and Whiskey. Please follow that show. Uh, you can uh, follow Wiley on all the social media. I'll link it down below. I, I know he's, he's got it. And his website, of course. Uh, what's your website again? WileyMcGraw.com. W-Y-L-I-E. McGraw.com. You won't Simple. forget that. Uh, thank you, brother, yeah. for uh, coming on the show and uh, sharing a little bit of your history and, and hopefully motivating some people. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me again. Appreciate it.